it is that time of the year again when you're not sure whether you want to continue with your medical aid or not or whether you want to change skins or the options that you are on. But I'm sure you're going to be a good one. Good morning and a very warm welcome to Body Dwarfs House Call here on SABC2. I'm going to be a good one. 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 Now, medical aid is often a very serious grudge purchase. And yet I know of many people who have had to sell their cars or even mortgage their homes just to settle their medical bills. And even more difficult is how to choose your medical aid or option. So then again, I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to tell you about one of the most important One of the most important financial decisions you might have to make this year. So don't forget to join our discussion by joining us on 011-326-4740 with your questions and comments on how to choose your medical aid. Or you can send your SMSs to Bonitas33723. We're also joined in studio by Buti Tladi, who's managing director. Who I am, I'm health, health at Alexander Forbes. She's going to tell us a little bit more about that one. And of course, we're also joined by Heidi Kruger, who's the head of corporate communications at the Board of Healthcare Funders. But first, let us hear what South Africans have to say about this matter. Let's watch. When I chose my medical aid, I um, went with a with medical aid that my company. Um, asked us to go to. Um, so because they pay half of my medical aid, I decided to go to that medical aid. I could have gone to another one, but the benefit for me, and I think we're very fortunate, is that my company pay half of our medical aid. And since medical aid is very expensive, it helps a lot. I'm quite happy with my scheme. Um, the options, there's a lot of options. It's sometimes too many options, it gets very confusing. Um, but I chose a specific one and actually earlier this year I thought, you know, I am getting older and all of that, I want to re-look at my options and see if I can maybe move to a, a bit more expensive medical uh, or, or scheme, um, not medical aid but a specific category, um, where I'll pay a bit more but the benefits are more so, you know, you covered for more so I'll probably look at that again, but I'll stay with my medical scheme, I'm happy with it. I consult specialists maybe once a year. Um, for those guys that I go to, I don't really go to the GP first. It's like a gynecologist or a dentist, you know. It's, I call them directly, and then I go to them directly. Um, but in another case where, for instance, I'll get sick, I'll go to my GP first and ask him to, to refer me to a specialist. My medical aid give me a list of doctors that I um, should go to. They don't tell you you must go to them, but those specific doctors are normally free consultation or they pay, say, 80% of your consultation fee, whereas other doctors is maybe just 20% of your consultation fee, which obviously the better um, choice would be the ones which is free. So there's a list on, the, on their website, you always go and you look at the list and they say this one is 100% covered by your medical aid and those are the doctors I'll go to. Unless you've got a specific person or specific specialist you prefer, but then you have to know you'll have to pay out of your pocket. I've called my medical aid a few times actually this year about um, certain issues or certain questions I've had and I must say they were very professional. Uh, my issue was dealt with immediately. The very same day I got an email saying thanks for your call with everything that was discussed and the issue was resolved immediately. So um, I must say they're very professional with that because you know sometimes when you have to make calls it can be so tedious and you've got to sit on the line forever and they don't help you and you just get angry and upset and I haven't had that issue with my medical aid. There's one thing that I think my medical aid can improve on and it would be personal involvement. Um, unless I call them, I never hear of them. I would appreciate it if they maybe have a consultant to come and see me maybe once a year and say, listen, are you still happy? These are your options. Um, 
because there are so many options, it gets so confusing, it would be nice to sit with someone who tells you, okay, this is your options, this is what we recommend for you at this age or with your specific um, profile. And then maybe make a routine call or an email now and again telling us about new specials and that kind of thing. I must say I don't really get that personal involvement at all or personal communication from my medical aid. <laughs> Actually, that last point I find very, very interesting that uh, this lady says she would do with a little bit more communication from mm -hmm. the scheme uh, and courtesy calls out there. A call at the end of the year to tell them about specials. I didn't know there were specials in the medical <laughs> aid involvement. But anyway, ladies, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Buti, let's start with you now. Mm -hmm. The last time you were here, you didn't have this fancy title of MD of Alexander <laughs> Hobbs Health. What, what, what's that all about? <laughs> Um, since the last time we met, I've also moved on in the company. and I, I was appointed manager, managing director of Alexander Forbes Health in mm. 2012. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah. What does this mean? Because I, and, I, and, I, and I have a reason why I'm asking mm. this, because you do what? As that you do brokerage or what mm -hmm. exactly do you do? What we do is mm. advise members in terms of what the most appropriate medical scheme would be for them. So in the business of, of advice. But as uh, well, how, to how does that differ from brokers? Okay. What it do, brokers generally provide advice, yeah. but I'm saying that generally brokers are associated with selling, whereas generally speaking, we don't necessarily like being called brokers mm. because literally our job is to put the member in the center of what we do. Okay. Generally as advisors or brokers, as you may call it, it does not really matter in terms of revenue which medical aid a member belongs to mm. because generally built into the contributions of all medical scheme members is an advice fee. Okay. So. Now, 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 who's supposed to be doing this communication, Heidi? Um, to with the members? Is, is it the scheme themselves or is it the goal between, which in this case are the advisors stroke the brokers? Who's supposed to be doing this? Well, I think both because mm -hmm. schemes often defer to brokers and advisors mm -hmm. to do that work for them. But the onus lies on the scheme, finally, to see that it's done. I mean, it, it's a very complex environment as we know. And so it's a very important role for schemes to, to play. Um, you know, because especially now at this time of the year where people are choosing maybe n another option or new schemes, they don't know how to choose, they don't know what to look for, they, g they maybe get the pamphlet with the new benefits that are going to be covered, but they don't necessarily know what they're looking of for. Of course they don't. I mean, the, la no, the one lady says complex. there are so many options, it's confusing. Yeah. So it is, the, it is the brokers and the advisors like Bootsy who are supposed to sit down with each and every individual employee and say, yeah. this is the best option for you and maybe this is the best scheme for you. Yes, and, this, and the schemes must make sure that that happens. Uh, anyway, let's go back to the sister of Mzanzi and hear what mm -hmm. these people have to say about exactly how they make these choices so that mm -hmm. it's not a figment of imagination, but we are guided by reality. Let's hear. At the previous company that I was with, uh, I was using the same medical aid. So when I came to the new company, I decided to continue because I was happy with their options. I'm not happy with the levies uh, because sometimes when you go to the chemist, I don't have money to pay for a certain medication. So if the medical aid can pay the full amount for the levies, then I'll be happy. I was angry recently because at the previous uh, job that I was working at, um, when I resigned, I didn't notify the medical aid, so I didn't pay for that particular month. So when I decided to continue with the medical aid and I called them, they told me that there's a waiting period. So if they did explain earlier on, then I would have known that I need to notify them so that they know and I can make arrangements when to pay them. Uh, I wouldn't know whether the option that I chose, uh, I'm paying more or less because I don't know other medical aids, what are they offering. Uh, there's three independent on my medical aid and myself, so I'm paying 3,400 rent. So, um, but the options, I'm happy with them because the savings account, meaning if my day-to-day -day is finished, then I can use my savings. Okay, let's get the basics right now. The one lady said she didn't have to choose a scheme. Mm -hmm. The employer had already chosen a scheme for her. Mm. Is that fair? Doc, there are over um, nearly 90 different medical schemes, registered medical schemes in the country, Correct. of which some are open and some are restricted. And what are the differences between them? The difference being that in terms of an open medical scheme, any member of the public can or any employer can apply to be a participant in that scheme. Correct. So you have various 
um, employers that participate in that. In fact, by virtue of its own registration, it cannot decline or deny you membership of, a, of an open medical scheme. Because the Medical Schemes Act ensures that, that, that denial. You have guaranteed acceptance Correct. to that. Mm -hmm. On a restricted scheme, however, uh, it is by, you can only participate by virtue of association, either with a certain employer or profession or an industry. For example, there could be a scheme for the banking industry. Mm -hmm. So there's different types. However, what most employers do is understand that there's just too many choices. There's over two, 250 different options to choose from. It can be very confusing. So often an employer would get involved to try and, and guide the choice that, uh, that employees can make. So it is all in good intention to try and, and ensure that people are on an appropriate scheme uh, to ensure that the scheme that they're on is able to pay their claims ultimately when they do submit them to the scheme. Okay. And, and when that happens, what, what, what do these employers look at before they, they, they select a particular scheme for their employees? What do they look at? Well, there they would have to go to independent um, advisories to, to see what, which scheme would be most appropriate for their group of employees. Remember, some employers have 50,000 people that they have to then move to um, a certain scheme. So, you know, they would have to see the range of, of uh, income, for instance, of those employees and make sure that there was an option, a, a, a proper option for, or a relevant option for each of those um, income groups on, on that scheme. Obviously they couldn't, you know, they wouldn't know the, the, everybody's health status or what they would need or what chronic conditions they were on, but you know, their job would be to provide a scheme with a, as many options as is necessary and a wide enough, a broad enough range of, of benefits to cover mm. most people. Yeah, so good, Pamela. But let's say I want a, a typical medical scheme and how to differentiate between, between these two entities and exactly how they go about doing their business. Let's watch. Bonita's source of competitive advantage are our size, our emphasis on value for money, and simplicity. Our strong financial position and our excellent key indicators. We are the second largest private medical scheme in the country and with a solvency ratio of 33.3%, supported by a credit rating of AA-, our members have the peace of mind knowing that we have financial stability to pay their claims. In fact, Bonitas has a proven track record of being the most generous medical scheme in this regard. Our solvency ratio is well above the minimum allowed by the law. The average age of our members and pensioner ratio are both lower than the industry average, and this helps us limit contribution increases. Finally, we manage our expenses very prudently to ensure that more of our contributions are used to pay claims. These factors allow us to offer a broad range of affordable options, and our generous benefits are specifically designed to give excellent value for money. In the medical scheme industry, the size of the scheme is important. Large schemes are very more stable. They benefit from economies of scale and they have a greater negotiating power and influence within the industry. Members want peace of mind from their medical schemes and because large schemes are able to spread the risk of large claims across a bigger pool of people, they tend to be more stable. A large scheme is also better positioned to benefit from economies of scale in areas such as administration and managed care cost. Similarly, larger schemes have more negotiating power during negotiations with service providers and hospitals. As such, we are able to pass their savings on members in the form of lower contribution increases. Yeah, now if you're an employee and uh, you're looking at all of these things that are critical in you deciding whether the medical scheme that you're going to choose is appropriate. That is assuming that you have mm -hmm. that choice and that choice is not made by the HR director or the HR manager mm -hmm. on your behalf. You're looking at what? You're looking at the size of the scheme because the assumption is that the bigger the scheme, mm -hmm. the more stable it is. You look at the solvency ratio, which is the amount of money that the scheme has put in reserves uh, after they paid everything so that should anything happen, they have the ability to mm -hmm. deal with the claims. What else do you look at? Do you look, it also depends on the horizon of your decision. How long do you want that decision to be appropriate for? For an employer, they may have a longer horizon because you cannot move a group of members from one scheme to the other on an annual mm. basis. Okay. So they would want to make it a decision that is ap appropriate in the immediate outset to the long term as well. Okay. At an individual level, once all of those things have been decided, the things that we've mentioned about the sustainability of that scheme and so forth, I would want to ensure that you choose a plan that is based on your health needs. And your health needs will change as you go through your various life stages. 
as a young person entering the work environment for the first time, you generally do not need or do not have a high need for, for health care. So you would choose, for example, a basic hospital plan. As you go into your mid to, uh, mid to late 20s, into your 30s, you're thinking perhaps of having a family. Mm -hmm. Then you perhaps would want a plan that has richer benefits. Mm -hmm. And obviously as you go into your 40s, 50s and so on, and, and, and you, you get older, you would want a richer benefit plan mm -hmm. because ten, things tend to go wrong as the older, the older one do. gets. And they do. The older one gets. So you need to choose based on your health needs. However, the issues of affordability always come into the, into, into the fore. Is it, is it, is it prudent, yes. therefore, Heidi, to, 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 to try and stick to one scheme and maybe change yeah. options instead of jumping around and changing scheme? Is, is there a benefit that you've been with the scheme for a certain period of time? Yes, because you know the ethos of the scheme. I believe that there is a benefit. And just to, to your first port of call is always to look to see if there's a different option that would suit you better. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you change schemes, there are some disadvantages. I mean, it's not to say that you can't change schemes, mm -hmm. but there's sometimes waiting periods which apply and that sort of things, depending on what, you, you know, your past activities. But um, I was going to say also, I mean, affordability is key. Your health needs are key. Mm -hmm. The health needs of your family are key. What chronic conditions you have. Do your chronic conditions fall within the prescribed minimum benefits, that's the basket of condi chronic conditions yes. that all schemes must cover. And if it doesn't, uh, does the scheme... To cover, not yes, must cover. <laughs> must cover, yeah, legally must cover, yeah. yeah. Mm. And um, if they don't fall into the, that basket, then do, is there coverage for those chronic conditions? Have you got a planned event coming up? You know, do, what rate, at what rate does your option or your scheme pay the hospital? Things like that that you really need to look at apart from sort of whether the scheme is sustainable and the solvency and, and all well, that Well, the issue of affordability maybe is secondary because half the time this is taken <laughs> off your salary. So you, don't oh, yes. <laughs> you don't have to go and pay physically. Yes. So, but also that, that helps with the sustainability of the schemes that they don't have to be chasing people for contributions. But we'll continue with this yes. because we need to unpack exactly on how members should, what the members should be doing to ensure that their schemes are sustainable. That's right. So to how we have a new We'll continue our discussion on how to choose your medical aid. Hang on around the bottom. Let us hear more about this matter from ordinary South Africans. The company that I work for, it belongs to a certain medical aid, so we all belong to one medical aid, so you don't have a choice to, to go to another medical aid or you just have to be on that one medical aid that we belong to. Partially, I'm happy, but because I was a and when you find out only man I so so good situation, but this thing about Kavan, maybe some certain procedures, so you are there and I'll be happy. I medical aid laying go i in a restrictions or would you una two doctors less or ya goes and uh again community doctor no we a panel of doctor lab because who you will have registered it in Japan. Uh medical aid yam mang a phone and gang happy respond there because being goes on a good sitting goes on Zagala and Manga being told accident in Clamping Echo go region laying in Clalaguyo. I in a different hospital there because I need to wear to the specific hospital but they, they told me uh, I can be admitted to the nearest hospital which is a private hospital uh, once or just once when I'm there when I'm in an accident Auswood, the patients out there the members out there don't understand their benefits they are therefore not in a position to make informed choices especially when it comes to the various options. They don't know, this lady does not know what emergency services are available. They, they don't know what, what, what it is that they have to pay out of their pocket. Now, being this time of the year, this is the type of thing that leads to people saying, you know what, I'm going to opt out. Mm. 
let me rather pay out of pocket and then I can manage the process much better. And in that process, they lose them half the time. It is only when they have made such a decision that two weeks later, you get into a medical catastrophic situation. Now, how do you get members to understand exactly the choices, the options, the benefits, the co-payments and all of those things? Because clearly, South Africans are telling us they are not well informed. That is, that is certainly true. I think it is, as an industry, we've gone a long way to try and put together what I call an arsenal of um, information and weaponry that we can use to go out into the, into the industry, into the members, and try and make sure that they better understand these benefits that they pay so much money for. So among others, as uh, Heidi mentioned earlier on, the schemes themselves have an, have an obligation to provide information. But at the same time... But they, they don't. They, yes. They certainly do. I okay. think, by and large, the schemes that are we certainly interact with. Well, they don't ensure that the members understand the that's, information. That's, 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 a, that's a difficulty. That's the crux of the issue. Mm. And what we have done to try and beef it up, certainly from an advisory, from a brokerage perspective, is to go out into the various employer groups and actually ensure that we do training at that level. Who do we you also, train? Who do you train? Do, we do training to the members, and it's generally oh, organized the through the themselves. employer, okay. to the members themselves. In fact, it's done in various forms. We start with doing it in group sessions, where you invite people to a session and you unpack the benefits and the changes. The good thing about that is that as you sit among your colleagues, um, you tend to listen and get a better sense of what is going on. But over and above that, those are beefed up by individual consultations, where after each of these group sessions, you sit with each individual and you unpack them. You unpack what it means for them, what are their needs. You go through a needs analysis. In fact, the Financial Services Board requires of us to do that thorough needs analysis with each individual that we are appointed to. Now, now, now Heidi, can you just explain this? Mm. Every member of a medical scheme mm. has got a broker assigned to yeah. them? No, not oh. at all. She says yes, you say no. So. No, no, no. <laughs> not, not well, not okay. really. Okay. Okay. To. You <laughs> can choose to have a broker okay. or not. And generally an employer group would choose a brokerage to mm. inform if they wanted to move mm. or if they wanted to choose a medical But you can scheme. see these people have never had contact with the brokers, clearly. Yes, so, and so, uh, yeah. So th there's a, there's a gap in the communication somewhere. No, absolutely there is. And, and because it's such a complex environment, you may, you may read your scheme rules or your benefits mm. when they come in, but when the catastrophic uh, uh, incident occurs, you may not remember that this is your network hospital or that's where you've, you've got to go. Or so who must intervene at that point to guide you how, how, how to this go through Either that? the scheme or the advisor, the broker. Mm. You ha there has to be somebody that you can call upon. Most schemes will have a, a, you know, quite an active call center that you can phone for pre-auth. Mm. But also if you've got an employer, if your employer's got an advisory group, um, mm. then that's who you would call. So, so one of the first things that must be done is that you've got to be equipped with the, with the contact details of the people that you may have to make contact with should you need certain Absolutely. services. Absolutely. If you're sitting at a pharmacy and they're refusing to give you your medication, yeah. you've got to be able to phone somebody there and then, you know, when and, they'll, they'll, and they'll respond yes. to accordingly. When you have car insurance, for example, and I'm not saying that medical mm. aid is like insurance because it's, not, it's a different animal altogether, mm. medical aid and insurance, but mm. you know, when you get c car insurance, you normally get a a sticker that you put your license on with and it tells you who you phone in the event of an accident or or you need a tow truck or mm. something like that and i think that medical schemes and advisors could you know go some way to improving the the kind of communication by doing that kind of thing I'm making it you, very accessible i'm going to ask you next that you as a board of healthcare funders how do you ensure that the medical schemes do what, what they're supposed to do by way of giving the appropriate information or whether appropriate information has not been given, mm. what it is that you do to get people out of a situation where they might have to pay out of their pockets for stuff that they may not have understood and therefore cannot be seen to be responsible for. But let's hear and give your comments after watching this one. medical aid to Without those doctors, and doctor and lore have a medical aid work on fee option or a kilo pharmacy without a doctor's prescription. And trailing or as I am to hand the core, one I can cool. And then Cafona like my medical aid employee or a doctor or when one I is a specialist. And then 20 years ago, I was a doctor. I choose according to medical rates. And uh, medication, you cannot say, go doctoring, 
I choose to take medication and everything. So what if that medication, I choose to take one hour talk and then I cannot afford to pay? Can I go? What's going to happen? Go on. The two doctors take it carefully. They want to transfer and refer to a specialist. And then I go in there. A specialist take you on a transfer weekly, but yeah, if I have a limit, I have to go to the doctor and then get a specialist thing. And the doctor will think I'm not because you have to phone. And then after phoning, but you must wait for five days. And then in that five days, what happens? God now or my child, because it's only me and my child on the medical aid. So I got a little bit on my medical aid to let him for access to see any other doctor, like that long or we born out of province or anywhere in the province. Because what if I'm on the streets since I'm moving around? And there's a doctor next to me, but I can't. I have to go to specifically those that I chose. So in Karata, if they give me an option to see any other doctor, I would love to see. Mm. If you want to expand your choice of practitioners that you can consult, you've got to pay the price for it. Mm. Because in, in, in trying to contain the costs, you guys want members out there to limit utilization. Mm -hmm. Because in the final analysis, medical cost is a function of price and utilization. Mm -hmm. And the price, you cannot do much about it because mm -hmm. you guys always complain mm -hmm. that you cannot control the price. Mm -hmm. In fact, the market inquiry that is going to be conducted by the competition commission is actually looking at how price can be controlled or can be regulated within the private sector. So price you cannot do much about. It is utilization that you as yes. members of the scheme or advisors of the scheme want members to understand that we need to use medical services judiciously. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you do is to limit the choices. Because as, you can, as we've seen, too many South Africans consult specialists and directly mm -hmm. so. Now let's talk about what just happened now here. This lady had to wait for five days for a particular medication. And that's nonsensical. It should not have happened. It doesn't sound normal or ordinary, ordinary in terms of how medical schemes generally work. Mm. I think one of the most frustrating things about, uh, about how members experience medical scheme is that I think in an ideal world, we would want to uh, have everything paid for uh, whenever we see a doctor. The reality of it is that medical schemes work within a budget. Uh, they cannot, for example, guarantee to pay anything that a doctor charges because they do not know what your doctor will charge. And ultimately, it's a budget. And, and they cannot dictate what, what your doctor must do from their professional Correct. point of view. Mm. E exactly. But, but then they have to deal mm. with what it costs. Correct. Now, now in the final mm. analysis then, how, how, do you, how do you govern medicines that patients or members might want to use as against the doctors that they might have to consult and the specialist? You've got options where all of those three things are restricted. Most options on most schemes have what we call a formulary, which is a mm. list of medication um, linked to a condition, mm. which the scheme will pay for. And, um, and if you use anything outside that, there either, may be either, co -pays. either you, you'll have to pay part of well, it. Well, there may be a co-pay, yeah. Okay. yeah. But I must say, it does sound very strange that mm. that lady had to wait for five days for medication. That's not usual, and I'm sure it's not the intention mm. of the scheme for that to happen. Um, it's also very important to, for, for consumers, members of medical schemes, to know why those limitations of network doctors or designated service to providers are put why. in place. Yeah. Yes, mm. and it's to contain cost. Remember that a medical scheme is like a cooperative or a stock fell, if mm. you like. Mm. So everybody pools their money, mm. apart from the savings account money, but everybody pools their money, and then that money gets paid out according to need. Mm. So whoever needs it most, or you know, to, to, to the big catastrophic things. So in order to make that money go further, and to, in order to contain the premium increases or the, or the rate of your medical aid monthly premium, um, a medical aid would say to a group of doctors, will you be our network doctors or a group of hospitals, and we'll provide you with the volume, but then you must give, give us better rates. And in that way, they're able to lower the premium for those pe people that, that uh, subscribe to that particular option. So it's important to know, you know, for consumers to know why schemes do the things okay. that they do in order to make the money uh, go further. So in other words, just before you take an air break, one of the things that a member might want you to look at before they change or when they are deciding on what scheme to take or what option to take is you go for a scheme 
that will give you more options at a lower contribution. Ideally, you would want to do that. Yeah. You would want to pay as little as possible for the most mm. benefits. Mm. However, uh, it's also a trade. It's, it's also a trade-off because sometimes, as you mentioned earlier, a scheme would give you very rich benefits, but require of you to go to a certain network mm. because they've negotiated with those providers, and okay. through those providers, they will minimize the gaps I in see. the cover that you will get. Okay. But you will kind of you will give up your freedom of choice. Mm for richer benefits. I see. And you just need to understand what the networks are, yeah. who are the people in that so network. So it's a continued give and take. And some of these things are not Correct. placed on you to make your life difficult. Mm -hmm. It is actually to ensure that the scheme that you belong to is sustainable. Because the last thing you need is to be told that your scheme has gone under or it's been liquidated or it is broke. When you con we'll continue our discussion on how to choose your medical aid when you return. Welcome back. You're watching Politos House Call here on SABC2. And today we focus on how to choose your medical aid. Let's watch. I believe I've got this correct package that suits my family's needs best. I asked my consultant um, which uh, medical aid uh, scheme would be best for me and my wife. Um, and uh, we looked at five different medical schemes and um, everything they have to offer um, falling in a certain price category that we were able and um, so he helped us to to find the best uh, suitable package for us i don't think it's necessary to keep my medical records because i believe my medical aid does have all that on their system already i changed gp when i came onto the scheme that i'm on now but I prefer to stay with a GP so that you build up a relationship and a history so that they know that what they've treated you for before so you don't have to explain yourself every time. I believe one has to revisit your plan and your scheme every year and make sure that you've got the best option for your situation as one's personal home situations changes um, and also medical scheme always comes up with new options and things. So it's something that you have to stay abreast of. Busi, I want to hone, on, hone in on the last point, which a gentleman says that it's important to review your medical scheme on an annual basis to see if it still satisfies your needs. And as you said, you also look into the immediate future and see if there's anything that, that's, that has changed that might um, enjoin you to, to, to relook and maybe reassess and make mm -hmm. different decisions altogether. Now, what is the best way of doing that? If you're an employee for a big parastatal ESCOM, Transnet, whatever, mm -hmm. um, you got you got a scheme or various schemes that mm -hmm. are available to you, and you got all of these options that are confusing. If you want to review, like you want to review mm -hmm. your insurance, household insurance, or your car insurance, or anything that 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 you that you understand, how, what is the best way of doing it? Who do you go for? The best way of doing it is to sit with somebody that is fit and proper to give you the advice that you need. And who does that? It will be a broker, it will be a consultant that you have. And how do you find that? If you're working for ESCOM, where do you find the broker? You, the easiest thing is to phone your HR department, okay. alternatively your medical scheme, because they will have on record which company has been appointed to provide that service to your employer. Okay. But similarly, if you're an individual member that has joined the scheme in your individual capacity, you probably would have done that through a broker. If not, it gives you an opportunity to review those that are available and appoint one that you believe will, 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 will be able to give you the information. Does it cost you, you extra money to get a broker available to you as a member? Um, well, the schemes can pay brokers up to, I think, 3%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but you, as a, as a person, as an individual, wouldn't feel that. It would, it would be amortized or, you know, over the scheme. We all say it is important for patients to do two things so that they can avoid duplication of services, which mm, obviously correct. will raise the cost. One is that yes. you stick to one doctor because they know your history, mm. they know the tests that they've done and everything. They are not going to repeat the yes. test. If you jump from one doctor to another because these doctors don't communicate, they do the test that the previous okay. doctor has done. Secondly, to just keep medical records. But you had somebody who says, you know what? I'm not keeping my records. The scheme's responsibility to keep the records. Is it something that you'd say? It's very difficult for an individual mm. to keep their own medical records. I mean, mm. you know, the doctors have to supply the scheme with the ICD-10 codes, which is the diagnostic code and the procedural codes. So the scheme has all those records, and so does the doctor. No, but but, but we've seen in many instances where the many tests are repeated, mm. and, 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 and yet the scheme has the records. So how do you remedy that situation then? 
out, out, out of concur with that. It's very difficult because the information sits in various pockets. Um, as a member, as an individual, I may have certain records, the scheme has certain records, and, and not everybody, for example, your scheme would have records in terms of what they've covered, what they've paid, the types of tests, mm -hmm. but they may not necessarily know what the treatment plan would be depending on what it is. So I think it's incumbent on me as an individual to understand who has what records and then reach out and get the records and as and when I need them. As when in, need in countries where they have an NHS or something like that, mm -hmm. like in the UK or NHI or whatever, a one sort of s integrated system, um, there would be a, an electronic kind of record um, that would be sent from doctor to doctor and that, that would be owned by the Well, NHS. the NDP or the National Development Plan actually says at Absolutely. some point you need to have the healthcare system that is that, 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 that has been systematized, yeah. whether you're in the public or the private sector, to the database where mm -hmm. any information can be arrived at and accessed. So Absolutely. Absolutely. It would save a lot of effort. Maraka Ruka or Varimbat or Vansa Dimense. Let's go back to the streets of Mzansi. When I started working at the company, they told me that we had to use a certain medical aid. So it was basically part of their policy that we would have to use the medical aid supplied by them. I am happy with the options that I'm on and the scheme that I'm on. Um, it provides and it covers all my day-to-day -day benefits and I'm happy with that. I don't mind using um, generic or original medication as long as it both has the effect that it should be. I really don't mind the scheme that I'm on covers all my day-to-day -day benefits and all my hospitalizations. What is this savings account and to what extent would that influence your choice of option or choice of medical scheme? There's different structures of medical scheme plans or options. The traditional plan is one where you had different pockets of benefits for each discipline. For example, you would have a separate benefit for your GPs, for your medication, for your glasses and so forth. And one could not really move the benefits or the limits from one discipline to another. So what you have, you use for that specific um, benefit. And if you don't use it, you can't really carry it over into the next year. But generally speaking, when, when one looked into the various limits and categories thereof, you had generous benefits. A savings account, on the other hand, pulls all of those into one common pool. And that which you do not use in any one year, you can carry over into the next year. Uh, but it is one pool from which everything is paid for. Your consultations, your medication, your glasses comes from that. So it, it is the higher option that will give you the benefit of a, of a savings account? Not necessarily. It's just a different way of looking at it. Okay. For people that, for example, say think that they have very low utilization and do not use their medical schemes extensively, they may, for example, select a savings plan because what I don't use, I carry over into the next year. Okay. And I may want to use my entire benefit on a glasses because that's the only thing that I need. I see. Whereas somebody else has different needs and will generally use everything, like your gla a bit of glasses, a bit of uh, dentistry and so forth, and they prefer to keep it separately. So each individual would need to decide what is suitable for them and their needs. Uh, but it's not necessarily that uh, savings type options are at your top end and, and so forth. It's just a different approach. It's to one of the most difficult concepts to mm -hmm. understand about this it medical scheme, this uh, savings account. And I hope that this explanation, as it has with me, has given you some clarity. We'll continue our discussion on how to choose your medical aid after the break. Welcome back. My name is Osato Lapelekatlo, I'm Saleta Simon, our political house call for SABC2. And today we are taking and we are talking about exactly how to choose your medical aid and what governs this decision. Let's watch further. Bonitas has addressed the rising cost of medical aid by keeping contribution increases to a minimum. Our options will increase by an average of 7.2% going into 2050, one of the lowest increases in the market. We have been able to keep increases relatively low by working with our large network of healthcare providers and by offering options that meet our members' needs and pockets. Negotiations with the healthcare service providers such as hospitals have also played a major role in ensuring we achieved a single digit contribution increase. To ensure members receive quality care and remain healthy, Bonitas has also implemented a number of programs that identify specific high risk members and assist them to manage their health. All our options now include a wellness benefit. We have been able to improve the members' health outcomes 
reduce claims and implement lower premium increases while still maintaining a strong financial position. Heidi, three mm. things that the member must look at before they make a decision to change or to stay with us. Your health needs and the health needs of your family. And how do you do that? You look at whether you've got chronic conditions, whether your or your would planned a, Would a GP be able to assist you with, with arriving at making an assessment of your healthcare situation as against what you need to cover? Or yes, I think so. Okay. Yes, I think that's a very prudent way to go Second forward. One. Second one is what you can afford. Can you afford the premium of the benefit option that you want? Thirdly, I would say that if it is a network option that you ensure that you have doctors and hospitals around that you can that can be easily reached by Th you that are easily and your family okay. because that can be a problem as well and and the fourth thing if i may mm. <laughs> is just to read your schemes rules <laughs> oh to know boy. what they expect mm. you to do so the level of literacy becomes important, important here because some people can't yeah. read even if you put it in their home language they will still battle with the technical issues what are some of the things that one must look at before arriving at the decision i just wanted to add on what heidi has already said among others is the long-term sustainability of that scheme. Mm -hmm. There is a council for medical scheme that is a regulator in this industry. They really do a good job in trying to ensure that the schemes that you have in place are financially sound, mm -hmm. uh, that they've got good governance and in, in place to ensure that uh, benefits are protected uh, in the interests of, of members. But also to speak to the administrators of the various medical schemes and the advisors that you have in place. Generally speaking, the information and the advice is available in all 11 official languages. So, and generally speaking, again, it is not costly to speak to, to, the, to the various providers in that. Many of us will, will respond to a please call me. So get that information, it is readily available. It has been posted to you, it is available through your HR providers, it generally is available. And members need to reach out and get that information. I've been a member of a medical scheme for well over 30 years. I've never been to a single annual general meeting. Oh. I'm making this admission on live television. <laughs> and it's a huge disappointment. But you know what? It I is. am not the only one. How important is it for members yeah, to important. attend these AGMs? Because it's a responsibility. It is their stock fail. They need to govern mm. and Absolutely. they need to dictate what is happening. And why are we not going to these AGMs? It's their money. You put your money, you entrust yes. your money to mm. the medical scheme trustees. Mm. It's a board of trustees that, that make the decisions on how your money is going to be spent. So it's very important that you get involved. And even though it's difficult, maybe a little bit difficult to attend, although that the Council for Medical Schemes working very hard on making um, the AGMs more accessible for more of the because members. Because they are not. So, the so, so we need to they, get more they members out In the there. past they mm. weren't, and they were just formalities, really. Yeah. But, but really, consumers need to take mm. responsibility. It is their money. But I guess it would be saying, I'm going to go to the medical aid. 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 Watching Politics House Court here on the SABC 2 and welcome back. Some Mushutella and Ivy, we are going to go to the last Heidi, final word. Many people out there are going to be choosing medical aid or options, and some of them will be saying, you know what? This thing is not sustainable. I don't see the benefit. I'm opting out. What word of advice do you want to give to all of those people who have this difficult decision to make? I want to say that the more people that are on medical schemes, the cheaper it can be because if we have young and healthy people on as well as elderly and sick and, and we are seeing young and healthy people opt off schemes because of the affordability issues um, the, the the more affordable and accessible private health care is going to be so think carefully about uh, about belonging to a medical scheme there are lots of options and they range in in price you know there's some really affordable options to some very high cost fully comprehensive options so they, there's there are options there for almost all like everything else there's people. entry level absolutely and there's premium and, premium and there's one mm. for most people and i would urge people 
to the long-term medical scheme if they possibly can. The earlier can. you join when you're still young, Absolutely. the more you'll benefit when you're much older. Because all the You're old people were yes. young at some point. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Your closing comments, my dear? I want to say is that in tough economic times, the cost of medical schemes or medical cover competes with so many other needs. Mm -hmm. However, it's so important to ensure that one has the ability to access quality care when they need it. All of the things that we've accumulated, all the things that we've worked so hard for become meaningless if we're not there to enjoy them because of the quality of life that we may need. So it is important to ensure that you ensure the most important assets and that most important asset has to be us. So we need to have cover when we need it and, and not compromise on that. So at the very least, if one has a financial pressure, rather downgrade the level of care that you have, the option that you're on as opposed to giving it up completely. completely. But one other thing that we, have no, we may not have covered and we'll mm -hmm. cover early in the new year is also to suggest that the schemes will run out of money if we become sicker and sicker and sicker Correct. by the day. And the minister, Dr. Arun Mtwari, tells us every day about the burden of disease, the quadruple burden of disease, disease in this country. So it is incumbent upon members, assisted by their schemes, to also engage in wellness efforts, to get as much health edu education the as health possible, to ensure that they live healthy, they exercise, they eat well, and the schemes are determined, and they are out there to assist members in ensuring that, because it is in the schemes' interest that people uh, uh, continue to look healthy Correct. and to act healthy and to be healthy, yeah. and it is also in their own interest, because then they won't be burdening the system. Even if you're in the public sector, you're still burdening the healthcare yes. system if you're not looking after themselves. Yes. Now, thank you very much. We hope that uh, the information that we have the, you know, dispensed of today you know, will be helpful to all of those people yeah, who have to make the decision. I but whatever so. the decision that yeah. you make, rather downgrade than opt out of the scheme okay. altogether. Butsi, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, congratulations on your appointment. All thank the you best so of luck in what is obviously a very challenging task. I know what? They could not have chosen a better person. No. And Heidi, thank you, thank you so very much, much also. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll be back next Saturday with salt. Let's try the chore. Salt. So don't miss it here on SABC2 at 8.30 in the morning. Arko Paneng Hapele Kimitla. Tato Haile Amren. Thanks for joining us today. And for me, Dr. Victor Ramoresi Ramatesi, Yakhaula Yai. Kena Manietel. Kimitamu Amletsa.